Gracious God, astonish us with your word this morning, with your holy humor. Open our hearts to receive whatever message you have for each one of us, including me, and may the meditations of my heart be found faithful. Amen. So from chaos to comfort, right? From comfort to hope. Have you ever experienced, I mean, besides the whole birth thing, but have you ever experienced that chaos to comfort, that whole spiral, and then, oh, okay, I'm held. When I first responded to God's call um, to ministry, I thought that God was calling me to be a worship leader, and I wrestled with God for a really long time. Um, I'm a little hard-headed sometimes. God used music to get my attention, and that is just so like God, because God knows exactly what kind of two-by-four, right, to hit you over the head with and get your attention. So early on, one of my mentors, and now a dear friend, Reverend uh, Todd Barden, brought me with him to a clergy meeting where they had pastors and worship leaders together, and what they were doing was they were discussing, discussing spiritual formation and how important it was to have a regular and ongoing conversation with God before you could lead anyone else to be connected. And a couple of the statistics that they presented that day um, from some survey of pastors all across the country and um, across multiple denominations surprised me that morning, these statistics. It made me actually a little sick. I remember, I remember having this long discussion uh, with Pastor Todd on the way home. We were over on the East Coast on the beach somewhere, heading back to Orlando. And the survey revealed that 70-something ridiculous percent of pastors only studied the Bible when they were preparing for their sermons. 70-something percent. About that same percentage um, did not set any time at all for personal devotions. And I couldn't believe it. How in the world did the, the supposedly most spiritual among us, um, how could they lead us to places that they, they, wouldn't, they weren't going to? They didn't know. Uh, there was nothing comforting or hopeful in that thought for me. Fast forward a few years, I was knee deep in seminary and working on my master's degree, pastoring my first church and mothering seven children of varying ages and stages and still trying to squeeze in regular date nights with my boo. I was burning the candle at both ends, sometimes in the middle and running on Jesus and coffee. <laughs> it was chaos, right? And there was a meme at that time that perfectly described me, and it said something like, I'm neither a night owl or an early bird. I'm some sort of permanently exhausted pigeon. <laughs> cool. I was horrified to discover that at the end of the day, when I would try to do my devotions and I would try to do my uh, examine, try to do my prayers, that I would start my conversations with God and... I would fall asleep, and I'd wake up the next day, and I was furious with myself, because I remembered those awful statistics that I had heard, and I didn't want them to be true for me as a pastor. Um, and worse, I could hear Jesus' voice ringing in my ears, can you not even stay awake for one hour? Oh, right? I started seeing a spiritual director to help navigate all this chaos in my life. And if you've never given yourself this tremendous gift of a spiritual director or a, or a therapist, I commend you. I, I commend it to you. It is a tremendous gift you could give yourself to keep you spiritually and emotionally healthy. And I told my spiritual director about this terrible habit that I had of talking to God and falling asleep. What a terrible person I was. What a terrible pastor I was. And she asked me, have any of your kids ever brought you a book, climbed up next to you, maybe climbed into your lap, asked you to read to them, and while you were reading, before you even got to the end of the book, have they ever, did they ever fall asleep on you? And I was like, of course, that happens all the time. Even when I'm doing like my best impressions and I, you know, all the voices and everything, of course, that happened all the time. And she asked me, do you, do you get mad at them? when that happens to you? <laughs> no. So why do you think God gets mad at you? At the end of your day, you head straight to God. 
You bring all the stuff from your day, right? You bring all the things from your heart and you climb right up into God's lap and you are so comfortable that you fall asleep, held gently, held tightly in God's arms. Why in the world would God be mad at you? And that thought comforted me so much. That thought gave me so much hope that I almost wept right there and in her living room. To think that I was beating myself up over something, that over God hearing me and holding me the way that I heard and held my children. Before I left that day, she gave me this small olive wooden cross. She told me to keep it near where I did my devotions as a reminder that I didn't have to earn God's love, didn't have to earn God's affection by how many words I spoke or how long my devotions were or how much time that I spent with God before falling asleep. And so when I went to bed that night, I held that cross in my hand. And I imagined myself climbing up into God's lap and leaning my head against God's shoulder and having this conversation about my day and my stuff and my heart and my life. And guess what happened? I still fell asleep. But the next morning, when I woke up, that little cross was still in my hand. And I'm gonna tell you, I am a restless sleeper, folks. I curl up in my blanket, and then I slide one foot out of the blanket, and then I pull it back in, because you know, the boogeyman and all that stuff, right? I start off laying on one side, and then I turn over to the other side, and, and then I do this kind of hokey pokey routine all night long. I am a restless sleeper, but I still woke up with that little cross in my hand. It happened all week that first week, and it still happens about five nights out of seven when I do it. I wake up with my cross in my hand five nights out of seven now. It's the first thing that I think about when I wake up in the middle of the night, when I wake up in the morning. If I don't have it on those nights that I don't have it, I go digging through the sheets looking for it or on the floor. It's not magic. There's no miracle in this cross. What it is is this beautiful reminder that God is holding on to me even when I'm not awake, even when I'm not aware, even when I don't have the strength or the faith or the understanding or the wherewithal to hold on to God. God is always holding on to me. The psalmist asks, where does my help come from? And the psalmist answers, my help comes from the Lord. God longs to help. God longs to come. God longs to gather us up in God's arms, longs to hear us and hold us and comfort us, and in that comfort to give us hope. From chaos to comfort, from comfort to hope. In our scripture today, the first day of our new liturgical year, Happy New Year, Um, the first Sunday of Advent where we lit the candle of hope is from Isaiah 40 verses one through five, and it says this. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain shall be made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of God, a word of hope for the people of God. We say thanks be to God. So just like Mikey, right, in that video clip from the movie, Look Who's Talking, he goes from the chaos of childbirth to the comfort of his mother's arms. So do the people of Israel. We hear about this chaos and this comfort from Isaiah, the prophet, the one talking to them. We hear from God who's the one talking to and through Isaiah. God's people have been living in chaos, and some of it has been of their own making as they rebelled against God's commands. 
And some of it's been beyond their control as exiles and as slaves. And the Israelites have faced both the consequences of their own faults and failures, as well as the struggles of living under foreign powers and principalities. And Isaiah has been prophesying judgment after judgment after judgment for 39 long chapters. And then God says, okay, enough. Climb up into my lap and just be held. God says, comfort my people. Let them know they are still mine. Speak to them compassionately, lovingly, softly, tenderly. Make sure they know that my grace completely covers them, that they have been forgiven and chaos is behind them. And Isaiah has spoken to them strongly and sternly, warning them in their rebellion. But here, now, there's comfort. This is, like, this is like a child holding their arms out for their child uh, after they've been uh, standing in the corner or after they've been sent to their room. The, the comfort that follows the consequences of their children's rebellious actions. This is like a parent and their child. It's not a transactional thing like a clerk in a jail after a prison sentence is over. Having a person sign for their belongings and stamping their paperwork all businesslike and standoffish. This, this is love and mercy and grace and compassion. This is God letting God's people know they won't be wandering aimlessly in circles for weeks and months and years and generations. This is God letting God's people know that they may still be in the desert but they're on their way home and God will be with them making their path smoother and shorter as they go because God is with them only a few verses later in verse 11 Isaiah will reassure these people of God God tends God's flock like a shepherd God gathers the lambs in God's arms and carries them close to God's own heart. Comfort and hope. And I wonder, how are we comforted? How do we hold on to hope? In the light maybe of our own mistakes or in spite of the things beyond our control that are happening in the chaos of life. And I believe that we hold on to this hope, how we are comforted. I believe we do that by faith, by deepening that faith through study and through prayer and through each other. Because it doesn't happen by osmosis, folks. We don't grow deeper in our faith by thinking about it or talking about it or writing about it or making a New Year's resolution about it. We have to own it. We have to do it. We have to actively seek out opportunities and ways and people to help us get wiser and stronger in our faith. If, and I'll tell you, if anyone needs help figuring that out, please come see me because I'd love to help you figure that out. I also believe that God loves us enough with a, with a reckless, abundant, extravagant love God loves us enough to send us reminders of that love, to get us through hard times and to give us hope. I say this at funerals and memorials all the time. God, send us, God sends us reminders of God's love. My cross is a reminder of that love and that hope. And holding it doesn't change my situation. It changes me. It's a touch point that grounds me. It came at just the right time with, from just the right person in just the right season, someone who was guiding me through a season. Both the cross and the saint who gave it to me are reminders of God's love and God's hope. And I have other reminders. I have other touch points, other saints who help to ground me and remind me of God's love and hope because we do this for one another, right? as much as we do it for ourselves because we are people of God baptized into this beautiful family. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. All people 
all of us, God's people. God uses us to remind each other of God's love. We love because God first loved us and we are commanded to love one another the way that we were first loved and the way that we continue to be loved and held by God. A friend told me recently that she was collecting acorns to help ground her in a difficult time of her life, a dark time where she needed to see God's love and to feel God holding her when it seemed like she couldn't stand. And I wondered about those acorns she was talking about, and she told me that it was from a line in a movie, Medea's Homecoming of all things. And in it, Medea, the main character, tells her family that people are always looking for big miracles from God, like, like looking for big, huge oak trees. But God often gives us little acorns along the way instead. We just need to pay attention. Amazingly enough, not long after she told me this, I came across a poem in a children's devotional book about acorns. And then I found a little bag of pocket tokens in an online store that I like that included a tiny little golden acorn. God often gives us little acorns along the way, reminders. We just need to pay attention. I added a new spiritual practice to my life this year, and each Monday I Zoom with a small group of women scattered all across North America. And we do this weekly exam, and I do a daily exam, and we do a weekly exam, which is a prayerful reflection on the people and the events around us um, to notice God's presence and God's movement through those people and events in, in all of our, the sacred ordinariness of our days. And one of the last reflections is to request a grace from God. Something, what can I ask to be given by God for the week ahead? What do I need to, be, to remind me to hold on to? Going back through my journal, I was struck to realize that each week, part of my response is to ask for a small measure of hope. Every week, a small measure of hope. Like Isaiah reminded the Israelites, And I remind myself each night and now each week, I may still be in the desert, but I'm on my way home. And God is always with me, always holding me, making the path shorter and smoother as I go because I know that I am held. I do not walk through the valley alone. We may be going through a hard season, any one of us at any time. We may be going through a hard season right now a winter of sorts, but eventually even the toughest winters give way to spring. Through Isaiah, God speaks and God tells us, do not dwell on the past. I am doing a new thing. I am making a way for you in the wilderness and I will be with you. And that same voice that tells us to prepare the way for the Lord tells us that God is doing a new thing. It's the same voice that calls us to be comforted, that reminds us that when we go through the waters, we will not drown. And when we go through the fire, we will not burn. It is the same voice that whispers urgently that our very names are written on the palms of God's hands, those hands that hold us. And I thank God for that, right? I thank God for all the reminders that God gives us through the words and the wisdom of prophets and of everyday, ordinary people, regular people all around me. And as we continue through our Advent sermon series, Look Who's Talking, we'll explore what God is saying to all of us through the gift of Jesus. We'll be reminded of so many things along the way, but most especially God's grand why in sending Jesus as a baby from chaos to comfort. What it says about God initiating such an incredible and unexpected act. Look who's talking will invite us to gaze upon and hear from God revealed in Jesus Christ, the living hope. God 
is still speaking. And as we begin this new year and the season of Advent, we're reminded that God is always holding on to us. How are we holding on to God? What are our reminders of comfort and hope? Will we pay attention to see if we can find those acorns along the way and to share them with one another? I challenge us to do this. Because as winter eventually gives way to spring and Advent will usher in Christmas, we are always Easter people who live in and look forward to the light of the resurrection, to Christ's return and our own eternal life with him. That's what we focus on in Advent. That's what we prepare for, not just to celebrate the coming of Christ over 2,000 years ago, but the good news of Jesus still to come. The hope of the kingdom of God with us, Emmanuel, with us forever. And what I pray for myself and what I pray for all of us is that we hold on to that reminder all year. Amen? And amen.